investigations of national interest with respect to the Correctional Service of Canada's ability to provide safe and humane detention. I'd like to draw your attention to two national investigations carried out by the members of my team who are with me today. I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Leticia Gutierrez, Chief Advisor, who conducted the investigation on cases of use of force involving black, indigenous, persons of color, and other vulnerable inmates in federal penitentiaries. I'd also like to introduce Ms. Stacy Ogg, Deputy Director and Senior Investigator in our systemic investigation on women. Each of them will take a few minutes to summarize the primary results of their investigations, beginning with Ms. Leticia Gutierrez. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zinger, and thank you to all who are joining us today. Our first national investigation examined the intersection of race and involvement in uses of force in federal penitentiaries. For clarity, uses of force involve any actions used by correctional authorities to gain control or cooperation of an incarcerated person. The findings of our investigation are based on a review of five years of incident data spanning from 2015 to 2020, representing nearly 10,000 documented use of force incidents. Over the study period, we found that Black, Indigenous, and other peoples of color accounted for nearly 60% of all individuals involved in a use of force incident. Specifically, Black and Indigenous individuals accounted for just over half of all persons involved in a use of force, while representing 37% of the federal prison population. In fact, Indigenous individuals who on average experienced more uses of force per person than any other group were also more likely to be involved in a use of force incident. Specifically, Indigenous individuals accounted for nearly 40% of all individuals involved in uses of force, despite representing on average 28% of the incarcerated population during this time. We also found that for incarcerated women, Black, Indigenous, and women of color accounted for nearly two-thirds of all women involved in uses of force. And these high numbers were largely driven by the increasing proportion of Indigenous women in federal custody, who over the study period accounted for 60% of all women involved in a use of force incident, while comprising 40% of incarcerated women overall. Importantly, our investigation found that regardless of risk level, security level, age, sentence length, or gender, when all was made equal, so to speak, identifying as an Indigenous or Black person alone, that factor alone was associated with a greater likelihood of involvement in a use of force incident. So based on the rather compelling evidence from our investigation, we conclude that force is indeed disproportionately used against Black and Indigenous persons in federal corrections in Canada, and that race is significantly and uniquely associated with the application of force in federal prisons. I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, Stacey Ogg, to share some findings on our investigation into women's corrections. Thank you, Leticia. 30 years ago, a government task force on federally sentenced women issued a groundbreaking report entitled Creating Choices. Our investigation of women's corrections examined what progress has been made since this report was first issued in 1990. We found that many of the principles and operational concepts of creating choices, including presumption of minimum security classification at admission, no perimeter fencing at the regional women's facilities, no maximum security units, prohibition against segregation, have all been abandoned in favor of a framework that puts security and control at the forefront of contemporary women's corrections. Nearly all of the problems identified 30 years ago remain in some form today. These include over-secure infrastructure at the five regional women's facilities, use of random strip searching, limited access to the community through temporary absences and work release, inadequate programming, job training, and employment opportunities. Our 30-year review of women's corrections concludes that the original principles of creating choices, empowerment, meaningful and responsible choices, respect and dignity, supportive environment, and shared responsibility have not been fully realized, resulting in questionable treatment and poor outcomes for incarcerated women, 
many of whom are indigenous and or have histories of physical or sexual abuse. I'll now turn it back to Dr. Zinger. Merci. Thank you, Letitia and Stacy, for your exceptional contribution to the report this year. As the correctional investigator, I'm particularly concerned by the conclusions of our investigation about the intersection between a, an individual's race and in, incidents involving use of force. The main recommendation of our investigation invites the Correctional Service to deal with systemic prejudice and to report publicly on achievable changes to the policy and practices on use of force that are aimed at reducing the overpopulation of Indigenous and Black people. I'm not convinced that the Correctional Service of Canada has either adequately acknowledged or answered compelling evidence of the unique role that race seems to play in how force is applied, how frequently it is used, and against whom. This investigation points to racial bias in the application of use of force in federal corrections. The disproportionate over-involvement of Black and Indigenous person in use of force incidents which seems to warrant a response that goes well beyond redoing the work of my office or re-examining the necessity or proportionality of the level or type of force used in these incidents. CC response to my recommendation, in my view, is defensive and inadequate, and the Correctional Service surely can do better. Permettez-moi de prendre... I'd like to take a few minutes to summarize other issues and investigations dealt with in my report. With respect to the structured intervention units, which replaced the practice of administrative segregation in November 2019, my preliminary conclusions point to the fact that there are problems in data collection limiting my ability to assess compliance with the legal obligations. During meetings and on-site visits, ironically, my investigative team gathered evidence suggesting that the structured intervention units often provide more favorable conditions and better access to service and staff compared to other sectors in maximum security institutions. Consequently, inmates often refuse to voluntarily leave these units. Those familiar with my reporting will know that I'm a big supporter of Canadian ratification of the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture, UPCAT. Ratification of this treaty would create a framework for independent and national and international inspection of all places of detention in Canada. In 2006, Canada first declared its intention to ratify UPCAT, and the current government repeatedly this commitment more than six years ago. 16 years later, we are still no closer to ratification, despite having 116 countries having signed or ratified UPCAT. Accordingly, I repeat my call for Canada to fulfill its com commitment by signing on to this most important human rights instrument. Finally, I would like to conclude by raising a more general issue, which concerns the mounting reporting burden that small and micro agency such as mine face. My office, which has 40 employees and a budget of about $5 million, has the same mandatory reporting requirement as the Correctional Service of Canada, which has 19,000 employees and a budget of $2.5 billion. Just like, just like the service, I'm required to issue 40 corporate reports each year, many of which are redundant or duplicative. The simple fact of the matter is that red tape and unnecessary reporting constrain the delivery of my core mandate. In my estimation, Essential element of public reporting, which includes transparency, results for Canadian, performance, accountability, stewardship, and value for money, can be condensed in a single 12-page corporate report. 
I have appended this 12-page alternative to my annual report for consideration by Treasury Board. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take your question. Merci de votre attention. C'est avec plaisir que je répondrai. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Now it's time for the questions. Those who would like to ask a question, please raise your hand, uh, and, or if you're in the room, go to the mic. Uh, it'll be one question and one follow-up, uh, and our first person in the room is Fraser Needham from APTN. Report. Um, I was wondering, uh, just in terms of the, you seem to say there's a racial bias and use of force in, in your investigation. Uh, any idea, perhaps, why that is? Uh, that, you know, it, were you able to conclude with if that's uh, guards don't have proper training in terms of mental health or sensitivity training or what? Did you have get any sense of why perhaps that's uh, there's a racial bias in terms of uh, use of force? Well, I think in society uh, in general, there, there certainly is systemic racism um, in society at large. And it's, uh, for me, it's, uh, 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 it, it's no surprise to see that there's some problem with respect to the criminal justice system and with respect to corrections um, uh, more specifically. Um, I think we all have, uh, un uh, I guess, unconscious bias, biases. Uh, but what's most important for me is that uh, when you have an organization, an agency that uh, has a great deal of uh, authority and power over individuals, that, um, that they do everything they can to ensure that uh, those unconscious bias don't lead to a uh, negative um, outcome. And this is, I think, what's most important here. So, um, like, intention for me is, is really not an issue when you talk about uh, systemic discrimination. Um, in fact, uh, simply having negative outcome uh, for one group compared to other racial group uh, is, uh, in fact, the definition of systemic uh, discrimination. Um, in terms of, uh, <clears throat> perhaps I can... Uh, uh, the kind of things that I would like the service to look into uh, would be that that sort of um, may prompt those uh, racial bias. It's, um, would be, some, for example, if um, uh, during a, a use of force incident, um, there is a statutory obligation, for example, to try to de-escalate the, uh, the situation. And uh, it may well be that um, uh, correctional staff uh, may, uh, may be ill-equipped to try to de-escalate those, uh, those uh, situations more effectively when it comes to Indigenous or Black offenders. There may be some cultural barriers. Uh, there may be uh, some unconscious bias. Um, and <clears throat> that could explain, for example, um, why we, we uh, witness such uh, high rates um, and been able to, um, uh, to basically demonstrate uh, racial bias and the unique contribution of race in use of force. Okay, and uh, my follow-up is just in terms of, uh, and this is a very quick uh, reading of your report uh, that was just released, is that it appears um, Corrections uh, Services Canada is, is moving more toward uh, sort of a course of type of uh, instruments, I guess, you mentioned sprays, things like that, and also segregation, these things, and it's, uh, and you also mentioned the high numbers of, of course, women that are now, in, and racialized women, including indigenous women that are in prisons, that, uh, do you, again, do you see this as a problem in terms of, uh, I, I guess, what uh, perhaps is the, is the correctional service not going in the right way in terms of rehabilitating women or, or recognizing some of their unique challenges? Uh, and pursuing coercion, I guess, rather than uh, maybe other rehabilitative measures? Well, we have an extraordinary situation when it comes to, uh, uh, to women corrections. Um, uh, nearly half of the incarcerated women in federal corrections are from Indigenous background. Uh, this is extraordinary. Um, and uh, what we are, are sort of a... Uh, report this year uh, demonstrate that despite the best intention 30 years ago to do uh, women's corrections differently, 
um, over the years, we saw those ideals uh, erode. Uh, and now we are in a, in a situation where women corrections uh, do not uh, uh, appear to be as women-centered and, uh, and uh, uniquely delivered uh, as it was uh, initially uh, intended to. Thank you. Uh, the next question goes to Olivia Stefanovich, uh, CBC News. Olivia, I think you have to unmute yourself. Good morning. Thank you for taking our questions today. Um, I, I'm wondering, how would you say the, you know, the corrections facilities can address uh, the fact that they are disproportionately using force against uh, people of color? Uh, this doesn't seem to be something that you can just easily address you know, in a course, for example, especially if uh, people have unconscious bias. So what would be your recommendations and how long will this take? Uh, that's a very good question. It is not an easy, uh, uh, an easy thing to do. Um, I can tell you that um, uh, the first step for me is for corrections to actually acknowledge that there is systemic racism in their organization. I think acknowledging it, it would be a first step. Um, I know that perhaps uh, there's reluctance to, to say it. Um, uh, simply because maybe it'll affect morale, but I think not uh, saying it publicly uh, has uh, will affect morale even in a more negative way. Um, and I, I think you know obviously they they have to um, uh, respond promptly and appropriately. And the response that I got is, in my view, again defensive and inappropriate. They simply don't accept the the findings of our um, uh, investigation. They want to do a consultation with stakeholders and then see whether they can uh, demonstrate whether or not uh, the force was used uh, uh, inappropriately uh, and uh, not proportionately. Uh, and then if they do find evidence of some racial bias, they will develop an action plan. I think this is um, in my view, very inappropriate. There should be an action plan uh, drafted right now. It should have started as soon as they got my report. Um, and it would include things like uh, obviously training uh, and, uh, and uh, trying to build better relationship between correctional officers uh, who, you know, uh, in general mistrust um, uh, prisoners and those who are incarcerated. Uh, and try to find ways to uh, be uh, better responsive to their uh, to uh, their needs um, and reduce uh, the tension and violence in penitentiaries. Thank you. And how would you say overall COVID-19 has impacted federal corrections? And specifically, how do you think they should address the issue of medical isolation among inmates? Uh, well, obviously, the uh, the impact of COVID nineteen has been uh, very, very difficult. Um, the conditions of confinement are exceptionally harsh. Uh, I've issued three different uh, COVID updates, and the conclusion uh, in those uh, updates still stand. Um, uh, there is an inordinate amount of time uh, in cells, spent in cells. There is a lot of lockdowns. Um, uh, and uh, all this will eventually lead to delays in, uh, in uh, early release and parole because uh, uh, there is a complete lack of uh, services with respect to access to programming, uh, for example. Um, as for the uh, uh, medical um, isolation, I've uh, commented in this annual report uh, about a particular practice that uh, uh, that uh, makes conditions much harsher uh, for uh, those who are incarcerated than those that are in the community. Uh, corrections still do not make the distinction between medical isolation and quarantine, and that's wrong. Um, and we have now, you know, probably around 400 active cases about uh, in penitentiary across the country but we have an inordinate amount of people in medical isolation. 
that can last as much as 24 or 25 days, uh, which goes well beyond what is the uh, accepted standard by public health or um, uh, community uh, standard. Um, so all to say is that uh, uh, I know it's exceptionally difficult to run penitentiaries during uh, uh, COVID and I, I have a great deal of sympathy and I, I, I uh, certainly uh, feel that uh, uh, a lot of efforts are been put to try to uh, uh, manage those outbreak or prevent them, uh, but the uh, impact uh, is extraordinary. With respect to use of force, we've seen incredible increases in use of force in the past couple of years. Um, we've seen um, uh, also increases in, in suicide attempts and self-harm, and that only uh, suggests um, uh, the frustration and, uh, and psychological harm uh, that is going on here. Christopher Nardi, National Post. Good morning, doctor. Um, my first question is just on a medical uh, isolation. Um, reading through your report quickly, I almost get the sense that uh, in some agencies, they might, or, or, or sorry, in some penitentiaries, they might be using medical isolation as a replacement for um, uh, iso what's it called when they isolate like a prisoner, basically. Um, and so I was wondering, do you do you get the sense that that's what they're trying to do? That they're kind of swapping out. Um, you know, isolation with medical isolation for certain um, prisoners? Well, I, um, as I say, I think uh, medical isolation is supposed to be managed by healthcare. And it's when somebody has either tested positive uh, or somebody has symptoms uh, of, uh, of COVID. Um, the um, quarantine is different, is that if you've been... Uh, uh, if there's some risk that you've been exposed to somebody who has uh, uh, COVID. Um, uh, but unfortunately, corrections just mix both and call everything medical isolation. So, for example, uh, currently there are uh, almost 900 people in federal corrections with uh, the, the current uh, inmate population is 12,200 right now. So you've got 900 people in what is called... Um, uh, medical isolation, uh, but um, what we know from from the, the the reports of correction is that there is less than 400 people that are actually uh, uh, are um, uh, tested positive. Um, so as to whether they, I, I don't think they are using um, uh, medical isolation as a as a form of uh, punishment or, or administrative segregation, solitary confinement. Uh, I don't think that's, um, that's what's happening. It's simply they're being overly cautious and their uh, routine and protocols are overly harsh uh, on, on uh, uh, population, on the um, uh, incarcerated population. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, my other question is, is going to be much broader. Um, you mentioned it earlier, so presumably you saw it, but just before your press conference began, we got um, a reaction already from Correctional Services and from the Minister, and I think you pointed this out. In, in most points, what they basically are suggesting to do is redo the work that you just published on their own and then later come up with solutions. And, and I've noticed this over the years that they tend to want to do that. I think we spoke last month about um, the plan for sexual assault and figuring out how much sexual assault was occurring in prisons, right? It took five years for them uh, to finish that after your, your incredible report a few years ago. So my broader question is, do you think that the government takes your work seriously? You know, the, obviously your studies are done very in depth, they're very well researched, but it almost feels like the government um, doesn't really grip a crap. Do you, do you get that feeling? Is that a frustration that your office has ultimately? Well, I, I've got to tell you that, yes, it's uh, two years in a row now that, um, that I'm very disappointed with uh, uh, the response of the Correctional Service of Canada. Last year was on uh, sexual coercion and violence, and this year is on, on the relationship between race and use of force. Um, and absolutely, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very disappointed. Uh, what I will tell you is that I am encouraged in many ways that uh, the Prime Minister uh, in uh, his mandate letter to the Minister of Public Safety, included the 
uh, trying to prevent sexual coercion and violence in penitentiaries, and also that um, uh, that the prime minister uses systemic racism in the criminal justice system, which includes corrections, uh, and asks the minister to take some steps. I think where there's a disconnect and even, I would say, a cognitive dissonance is between what uh, those mandate letters from the ministers uh, say and what <clears throat> correction is actually um, uh, moving, uh, moving in, in terms of uh, trying to address my recommendations. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think politically, I, I think they are doing the right thing. The mandate letters suggest they should be addressing it, uh, but correction for some reason uh, isn't uh, getting those marching orders and uh, effecting changes in a prompt and appropriate manner. Dylan Robertson, Winnipeg Free Press. Hi, Dr. Zinger. Thanks so much for taking our questions here. Uh, your report looks at a lot of issues that seem particularly prominent at Stony Mountain. Uh, you know, COVID infections, people not wanting to leave the SIUs, the overcrowding. I'm wondering if you think it's time to close Stony Mountain. Um, well, uh, l let me let me try to um, uh, yes. There there are problems in Stony Mountain. There's problem in uh, certainly uh, Saskatchewan Penitentiary. There are problems in Edmonton Institution. Uh, the Prairie seems to be the the the, the region which has the most challenges. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about um, to give you a bit of background on this. Um, uh, two of the three penitentiaries that are over 100 years old uh, are filled with Indigenous people. Uh, over 60 to close to 70% of those penitentiaries are, uh, are um, uh, housed, uh, housing uh, Indigenous people. So Stony Mountain and uh, Saskatchewan Penitentiary are the two of the, the three that are over 100 years. And those infrastructures uh, are, in my view, uh, inadequate. They reflect a very different um, penal philosophy. Um, so I would say that um, if, uh, uh, you know, they, they've obviously uh, attempted to renovate and to add new structures in, in those, inside those penitentiaries, but I am concerned about the uh, ability of those uh, aging penitentiary to deliver modern correctional practices. Uh, but I'll give you a bit more background. Uh, right now, I, as I mentioned, we have about 12,200 uh, incarcerated individuals in federal corrections. Corrections at the federal level of this is uh, uh, promoting single cell accommodation, which is great, that's the, uh, that's the international standard, uh, but they are currently a um, little over 4,000 empty cells in the system, which represent about eight penitentiaries. That's extraordinary. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, close penitentiaries, I think the, 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 uh, the time would be the appropriate one when you have such high vacancy. So nationally, we're talking about 25% uh, vacancy rate. Uh, in some region, for example, Atlantic region, it's up to 40%. Uh, lastly, uh, Canada uh, has the highest ratio between prisoners and employee. Uh, the ratio is now 1.2% uh, 1 .2 for, uh, for one. So you have 1.2 employee per prisoner. That's the highest ratio in my mind and certainly when we looked at uh, other jurisdiction. Uh, if, we, if you look at Europe, for example, it's about 3.5 uh, staff per prisoner. Um, so Canada, uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't mind about, uh, you know, investing a, in corrections uh, if you have outstanding correctional outcome, but that's not the case. And I think we, we should be uh, uh, scrutinize corrections and how it's been funded over the years um, uh, more carefully. 
Thank you. And uh, I'm going to double barrel uh, th this question because I, I wasn't clear, like, I, I took from your last answer, like, you, you don't think it's trying to close it in spite of all of these different flaws, but I wasn't sure. But I have to move on to my second one, if you'd like to clarify that one. Um, you, you mentioned the, the burden of your reporting duties in the office, and I'm just not sure how much of that is a new concern being raised. So can you please walk me through how you've raised this with the government over the years? And, you know, is this a new shift to go public about this concern about the, you know, you can't do your core functions? And, and have you been raising that internally? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. So again, with, with respect to Stony Mountain, it is not up to me to, uh, to decide uh, how to, uh, uh, you know, how to make corrections more effective. Um, and where, uh, you know, we know that there is uh, certainly uh, pressure on the, the, with respect to indigenous uh, offender population that is keep growing. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm looking at as an ombudsman in terms of compliance with the law. And I have concerns about those aging penitentiaries. I have concern that uh, uh, an awful lot of resources being spent and, uh, and yet we don't have best practices in every single area of correctional operation. Uh, with respect to uh, the, the mounting reporting burden, you're absolutely correct. This is an internal issue, but an internal issue that, um, uh, that uh, puts a pr lots of pressure on small and micro agencies uh, to deliver their mandates. Um, so there's a three-page summary of the issues in my annual report that details the uh, previous actions and the dialogue that, that uh, uh, a small steering committee and an, uh, a, a network of small micro-agency uh, had with the uh, Treasury Board. Uh, we've obviously made some progress, uh, but the tweaks proposed by, um, by Treasury Board uh, have not significantly re uh, reduced that burden. Um, so, um, <clears throat> we now have some micro uh, agencies and small agency that are dedicating uh, upwards in 30 to 50% of their resources to corporate services. Uh, and obviously that, um, uh, that uh, isn't an effective way of uh, delivering on your mandate. Um, so I have, uh, there's a picture in my annual report of a three inch binder that that's all the reporting I have to do um, every year and uh, and I, ha I, I keep uh, having to uh, increase uh, the services for uh, the, the resources for my corporate services uh, at the expense of my investigative um, uh, stream of employees. Um, so I, I, I hope that uh, someone covers this issue. Uh, I hope that um, I, I would be uh, called by um, <clears throat> public accounts committee to talk about this um, because we're not getting um, uh, uh, sort of the response that we're expecting. Um, 12 page compared to, uh, uh, to a three inch binder is extraordinary. I believe that that 12 page is uh, uh, paired with uh, uh, issues such as uh, the requirement for uh, proactive disclosure with respect to um, uh, <clears throat> uh, travel and hospitality, which you can get on every single small agencies uh, uh, and and departments across uh, 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 across government, uh, should uh, this kind of reporting should uh, make it more accessible uh, and uh, more accountable uh, than w the current system. And I think we, we, we need to, uh, as small agencies to, uh, to make sure that we, uh, we, uh, put the resources to deliver our mandate and not be, uh, uh, swamped with, uh, uh, red tape that makes us, makes it so difficult to, uh, uh to manage those small agencies. Thank you. Uh, next question, Jacques Galland from the Toronto Star. Hi, Dr. Zinger. Um, my first question is about the overrepresentation of Black and Indigenous people in prisons, an issue that you've highlighted a lot. I wanted to ask you, um, Bill C-5, which repeals some but not all mandatory minimum sentences, it's, it's supposed to tackle that issue, but I'm wondering, do you think that bill 
will make a significant impact or not on the issue of overrepresentation of Black and Indigenous people in prisons? Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I support the bill, um, but I don't think it's the panacea. Um, uh, if I take you back on how we got here, uh, let me um, um, uh, certainly let, let me give you a little, uh, at least part of, of my understanding of what happened over the years. Certainly during the Harper uh, years, so 10 years of, of government with the, uh, with the Conservatives, uh, what we saw was uh, incredible increases in the number of mandatory um, minimum penalties being brought forward. Uh, some of them were struck down because they were in, unconstitutional, but most of them uh, survived. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, corrections uh, received a lot of money because we were expecting, at least corrections was expecting, a huge increase in the number of inmates coming into federal uh, penitentiaries. So this is why now we have that incredible ratio of 1.2 um, uh, 1 1.2 um, uh, staff uh, per prisoner. Um, but that mass incarceration that was predicted never happened. Um, so because it didn't happen, I, I'm, uh, I don't think that by removing those, it will have much of an impact um, on federal correction. Uh, maybe it will at the provincial level, but that's not my jurisdiction. But certainly at the federal level, I don't think we will see um, uh, trends being uh, change, uh, changing because of the removal of those uh, mandatory. In essence, I think what happened is uh, uh, police and courts, when they saw the mandatory, they either adapted because they have some discretion, and that's what happens with uh, discretionary powers. Uh, so they had maybe mitigated the, the impact. Um, it's, uh, it's also, uh, possible that the, the, basically the mandatory that were imposed, uh, were simply a reflection of previous sentencing patterns, uh, when you considered aggravated factors, uh, therefore people were already receiving the same, about the same, uh, same, uh, sentences prior and after the introduction of those mandatory, uh, sentences. So, for example, if you have a, a new offense that included a gun, um, well, a gun was an aggravating factor and was already uh, getting uh, uh, harsher sentences. So I think it's, uh, it's good. It's cleaning up uh, uh, mandatory uh, sentences are, are not good uh, 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 penal policy. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that the government is moving that way, but I don't think it's going to be the panacea, and I wouldn't rely just on that to decrease the overrepresentation at the federal level. Thanks a lot. And then I just wanted to ask you if you could give us some examples of use of force incidents that you were finding in your review. Um, well, I, I mentioned there is a breakdown in my annual report that talks about uh, uh, for example, that 40% uh, uh, of those, uh, uh, we looked at almost 10,000 incidents uh, uh, relied on, um, on pepper spray, uh, followed by about 25% of, of uh, other uses of force, such as uh, baton or, or things like that. So a breakdown is there. Maybe I'll turn to uh, uh, Dr. Guiterez to give us uh, maybe an answer on the, the types of forces that um, that were included in in this uh, systemic investigation. So, Leticia, could you uh, expand a little bit? Uh, certainly. Thanks for your question. Um, so we categorize the types of force. There are over 40 different types of force, um, and we group them into five categories. So as Dr. Zinger mentioned, um, inflammatory sprays. So that includes OC spray, um, commonly referred to as pepper spray. In over 40% of cases, OC spray was used in some shape or form, either um, displayed or, or uh, dispensed non-inflammatory spray options. Uh, non-inflammatory options, restraints were another category, inflammatory munitions and firearms. Um, and if I understood your question correctly, there are different reasons for why force is used. Um, it could be assault related, behaviorally related um, in response to self-injury. Um, so those are different reasons for force that we looked at. 
uh, the most common that occurred was for assault related incidents. Um, but it should be interpreted with caution. We relied on um, the CSC's offender management system for this data. And oftentimes we found, and um, we've learned this through our own internal use of force reviews is CSC often tends to code um, the reasons for force based on the most generic or more significant um, behavior displayed. So for example, if an incident started uh, as an incident of self-injury, but over the course of that incident, a staff member is assaulted, it may just be considered an assault related incident. So that needs to be interpreted with caution and understood um, with those cautions. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? Y a-t-il d'autres questions? Thank you very much. This ends this press conference. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup.